Hello, welcome to the Manual Handling Collective. I'm your host, Simone Hepburn. I'm a physio and manual handling educator, and I'm passionate about injury prevention. This is a podcast where I speak frankly with the brain's trust of manual handling and other amazing industry leaders in and around the occupational health and wellness community. You get to meet them, you get to be inspired, you get to learn from their stories, and you get to stay up to date with the latest and greatest in manual handling and wellness. So let's crack on. Today's guest on the podcast, we have Scott Coleman. Scott has a background as a APA, Australian Physio Association, Association titled Sports Physio, which is kind of a big deal in the physio world. Uh, he's travelled with the Australian Athletics team, worked at the Australian Institute of Sport, had a biomechanics scholarship and studied all sorts of things, rowing, athletics, rugby, I think I read. Uh, tell me if I've missed anything, Scott. Uh, you've had your own private practice. Uh, amongst all this, you've also squeezed in a few roles in occupational health. And then for the last uh, almost four years, you are the founder and CEO of Preventure, which is a wearable technology company and uh, aiming at preventing workplace injuries. So fair to say we're lucky to have your brains in the Brains Trust today in the manual handling community. Uh, and I think it's high time our occupational athletes get some of the benefits from our sports science colleagues. So welcome, Scott. Thanks for having me on, although that um, introduction is a bit over the top, I think. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not, uh... Did I miss anything? <laughs> no, 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 no. I've been busy the last Sounds 25 like years. Yeah, wow. It's been a long journey. So, yeah, your journey, you started out as a physio treating patients. And then can you tell me a bit about how that journey's gone from patients to sports and athletes and then back around now to the not quite so sexy world of workplace health and safety? Yeah, of course. The um, So going through uni, I always wanted to be a sports physio. Did the clinical. Didn't we all? Yeah, it was yep. the cool side of it all. And, and the sacrifices went through that, the low pay that you get and... But it, for me, I always focused on the prevention side. So I tended to spend my time with repetitive sports, your athletics, your rowing, a bit of swimming, triathlon. I was a triathlete myself. So, so I was always interested in the avoidable injuries because in those sports, all injuries theoretically are avoidable. Mm. It all just comes down to the, the body's capacity to withstand the training load and the competition load mm. and getting that balance right, not overtraining, making sure that everything is, the strengths are, the, the, what needs to be strong is strong, what needs to be stretched is stretched. And and then um, got into private practice and had a good, um, when I was based on the Gold Coast actually, had a good mix of <coughs> private practice and elite sports. So I was doing Queensland Academy of Sport um, for half the week. But for me, that's where I really started to notice the difference because I was seeing workplace injuries and the patients that sustain workplace injuries not recovering the way they should. So we all know there's psychosocial components, but one thing led to another. I started looking at using the wearable technology that we used with the athletes, at the time it was Athletics Australia, looking into why that couldn't be used in the workplace. Because And what was the early technology that the athletes were using that you... It's all basic. It's accelerometers, which mm -hmm. measure point-to-point -point acceleration, gyroscopes, which measure rotational acceleration, and then there were other sensors that measured orientation, so magnetometer, which basically tells you where north is, and and that's pretty much it. Mm -hmm. It's not really complicated technology from a sensor perspective, but it's how the data is used. That's where sure. all the the I mean, science. And yeah, we're looking research. at Excel spreadsheets with hundreds of thousands of rows and columns. So as boring as that sounds, I love that because if you can use that data to identify a risk for an athlete. And then you can then go back to the coach and the athlete and address that risk straight away. You've hopefully prevented an injury at an elite athlete level. So I started doing that in the workplace. And around that time, mm. my mother sustained an injury. So she was working as a nurse and she was in her early 60s, getting towards the end of her career. And she was lifting a patient and she hurt her back. And in the end, she needed seven levels of a spine fused. And... Mm. Her injury prevention, so the, the nursing home where she worked, the injury prevention program involved a safe lifting manual that she had seen when she first started eight years prior, and that was it. There mm -hmm. was no injury prevention program on an ongoing basis, nothing integrated into their operations. 
that um, could have prevented the injury. Mm. So I saw... That would be quite common yeah. for nurses now and in the work that I do with manual handling education, it's the old nurses that really... Older nurses yeah. that really complain about that time. Would she have been around in the days of all the equipment we have now or was she before that? They're I don't know how old that. your mother she's is. Now, she's now in her 70s. Yeah, okay. yeah. So she so was, she was pre-hoist, pre-slide yeah. sheets. Yeah. Yeah, and um, but even then, the nursing career you, you tend to find most nurses in nursing homes where manual handling risks are arguably higher are all older nurses that have transitioned out of hospitals. So that was my mum, mm. and so I saw firsthand not just the financial impact, but the pain and suffering that comes from avoidable workplace injuries. Mm. If she had something alerting her to the dangers while she was you know, on work site and and going through her work tasks, mm. then it would have been avoided. So that was part of your motivation to ditch the athletes and come to the occupational athletes. Yes, it was hard, um, especially the in- initial transition because I did a I did a project. It was more of an experiment with Gold Coast City Council where mm-hmm. we used the sports wearables to collect just everything, which is what we do with athletes. You measure everything and mm. then you spend hours and hours and hours filtering through it. So we did that with the Gold Coast City Council and found some really interesting injury risks that could have been well that that could have been managed so we delivered a report a on the global insurance broker saw the report and said hang on this is this is the future um we've got a problem with Lynn Fox in melbourne so went down to Lynn Fox in melbourne did something similar um every project we did became more refined because i learned pretty early on the level of information needed to protect an athlete from injury is not as detailed as, you don't need it as detailed mm. and as complex as on the workplace. So with each project, it evolved and evolved. And off the back of the Linfox project, Aon offered me a spot in-house, which gave me two years of... Um, Refining suppose, even further. Yeah, or just spending time with the stakeholders mm. and really um, understanding the industry. And so talk about going from polar opposites, travelling the Australian athletics team within <laughs> three or four months, <laughs> I was in wearing a suit, in yes, in a CBD... Anon. And I'm um, hanging out with insurance brokers, of all people. So I was a black sheep, but I, I saw that as an opportunity to spend time with people I wouldn't have otherwise spent time with. These are mm. blue-collar workers who've mm. been lifting boxes since I was 16. So when you're spending all day walking around behind them with a laptop collecting data from sensors that are on them, you chat. You learn and, about their, yeah, their yeah, challenges yeah. in their lives. Yeah, and what matters to them, mm. how they feel the current injury prevention programs aren't effective, mm. but what they think could be beneficial Mm. and then you add on my stories about sports blue collar workers we know they love sports they love their family and friends and they love beer so (laughs) we um yeah we focus on the sport the family and friends we can't give away free beer beer (laughs) they all love beer it's just the way it is so uh you mentioned that athletes get you know monitored and tested to the hundredth degree can you tell us a little bit about that and what parts of that um, you think are useful for the occupational athlete? Yeah, it's funny. I've, I've discussed this and I've presented this concept at a lot of conferences because a lot of people are saying it's totally different. Athletes have motivational issues. They have all these other, other components that the workplace athlete or the blue-collar worker doesn't have. And that's how, over the years, we've worked out what is necessary and what isn't necessary. Mm. So yeah, I'm interested in that. In a sports team, so going back... 20 years, a rugby league team would have a training program. Every athlete would do the same thing. Mm. Now it's evolved to the point where every player on a team, on an AFL team, rugby league team, has their own training program. Customized so they would all, yeah, there'd be team sessions. Mm. So they'd be doing team sessions together. But in the gym, most of them would have their tailorized, their, their tailored mm. strength training program. Or on the field, they'd have their specific speed program. And a lot of that, the program is based off the data collected. So for sprints, for example, if it's a speed session for the backs in a rugby league team, every athlete would have certain thresholds. So they'd be doing the repetitions. As soon as the acceleration or as soon as the speed drop below a threshold, they know, all right, they've hit a level of fatigue that has now increased their risk of hamstring tears. So, so good. they stop. So good. Yeah. Mm. And same thing in the gym. You know, their strength program is customised to the data that has been collected throughout the off-season, throughout the previous season. So every player has this database of benchmarks wow. and that's that's how so it's... So they're wearing 
wearable sensors during training. Yep, every yeah. every session. And games so training and, and games so, yeah. and that sort of thing. And again, that's where we started with the workplace. We thought, all right, we want workers to wear sensors all the time. We collect all of the data. We establish benchmarks for those workers. And we do the same thing. You could judge when they're fatiguing and they could take a break. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. If they're overworked, if they've had a busy day compared to a not busy day. And, and, and also collecting data from all the individuals. Same thing as in the sports field. You can tailor injury prevention programs for those individuals, which doesn't happen in the workplace at the moment. Everyone has their standard manual handling training or their standard mm. um, safety training without identifying the specific risks for each individual worker. And a perfect example is, and, and there's assumptions in the workplace as well. So you assume that a five foot tall virgin um, cabin crew member, the injury risk for that cabin crew member to lift a seven kilo bag into the overhead compartment is higher than a six foot tall male. That's an assumption because yeah. you'd look at them, you'd think female, short, tall, male. We collected data and I actually got this call from Virgin um, a couple of months ago saying, hey, the sensors aren't working because... I can guess where this is going. This five foot tall female... She doesn't do it, does she? No alerts were popping up. She so probably no doesn't. Injury risk. She doesn't lift to the overhead. No, she does it, but she, she does? does it efficiently. Uh, yeah, yeah. I was going to say, does she not like, can no. someone do this for me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, she... So she had a combination of back oh. and legs when she lifted it up. She pushed it on the edge and she leveraged it in okay. and her elbows were in. And so her shoulders and her back didn't get in a high risk position. Great. However, the six foot tall male just grabbed it and threw it up there. Yeah. So six foot tall male may have been playing footy or cricket all weekend, gets there on Monday, grabs the bag, does his shoulder. So that's what mm. this data is all about. It's not, it's taking away assumptions and identifying injury risks for each individual. Okay. Yep. But we mm. don't, I mean, early on what the assumption was, let's get them to wear it every single day because that data would be incredible. But that was from a sports physio perspective. And it's where you practical. have all that backup support and someone to read the data and yes. interpret the data for you in a perfect Unlimited world. Unlimited budget as well. You know, if we can afford to have sensors on every worker, that'd be great. It but would. that's not reality. So again, over it's been five years or six years now. Yeah. And over that time, it's evolved to the point where now we, we've built a platform that allows flexibility to collect enough information from workers to establish those benchmarks. So they do mm -hmm. their manual handling training. They wear the sensors for, we recommend, five days in a row. Mm -hmm. Then off the back of that, you can then identify which of the workers need more effort, which of the workers don't need more effort. And then you do it again the next year and then the next year. And so for the workers who don't need a lot of training, the younger, the fitter, the ones that move smooth, there's no point in spending more money and wasting more resources on them because they don't need it. You check That's them next year and then when they get older, yes, then they will... Uh, theoretically, their injury risk will increase. So then the data allows you to put your resources and your time and your effort into the workers that need it the most. Hmm. And I know I had the opportunity to test your sensors out and uh, I, as a manual handling trainer, used it in training as the movement coach element. Can yep. you talk a little bit about movement coach versus the, is it task analysis? Yeah, the task analysis. So again, early on we were collecting data and we would, I was delivering reports that were very detailed and they were overload. And so I took a step back and thought, what are the main problems we're trying to solve? And they were, first of all, workers wanted feedback when they were in a high risk. They didn't want to report at the end of the day saying, yeah, five hours ago, you did these tasks that were a high risk of injury. They wanted an alert at the time so they can stop doing what they're doing and change their movements. So that was the first thing. It was the worker's need for feedback at the right time. Yeah. The second thing was a tool had to be built for safety professionals to assess tasks in a quick and accurate way. So that was the other feature we built. It's only got, our product's only got two features. It's got the movement coach, where the workers wear it all day, they get feedback throughout the day. And then there's a task analysis where a safety professional puts sensors on a worker. So it integrates in with operations, you're on site, you go up to a worker, pop the sensors on, and then through your smartphone, you collect the data and yep. video all in one go. Yep. And then and you then press that, stop. That and uploads a to your laptop yep. and your dashboard yep. and you can collect it there as well. Yeah. yeah. And even now that like, that's being refined to the point where you can compare multiple tasks in one go. You can establish a benchmark so you can see the video and the data for one worker and compare, compare it to, to the someone benchmark. else. I had a look at that. So for pre-employment, well. it's perfect. For workers returning to full duties, it's perfect because 
You, collect, you, you establish the benchmark, which is the optimal average way or the safest way. Everybody, so you take an average? No, no, no. You find out the. You can take an average, but we've found you find your pin up worker, the one that's doing exactly what they should be doing, there's your benchmark. Okay. And generally, it's not an average, it's the lowest. Because if you've okay. got five, one's got five high risk movements and the mm. other one's got three or four, it's you want the one enough. with zero or yeah. one. Yeah, yeah. So you want the optimal. And that's the benchmark, and then you, you can compare. You might get to that. have a little look at that. You've, did you bring them along today? Yes, I've got them right here. <laughs> of course, you did. Yes, we'll of pop I those on. Take them on. everywhere with me. Haynes Medical Australia are innately curious, solution focused, and always keen to share expert insights on keeping staff and patients safe. That's why today's Manual Handling Collective podcast is proudly brought to you by Haynes Medical Australia. So if you are not seeing the video, you're just listening to the audio now, can you describe, Scott's got the sensors in his hands, can yes, you describe what those. they are? Yep, so um, we're going back to the sports data analysis where we had sensors everywhere. So you're, you're measuring a lot of data. I started with that and then over the years I realised that we were collecting data from sensors that was interesting but not crucial. So we whittled it down, whittled it down to the point where, I mean, we all know shoulder injury risk and lower back injury risk, the cost of injuries for lower back and shoulders are the highest, they're the most frequent, but also the biggest predictor of shoulder injury in a workplace and the biggest predictor of lower back injury in the workplace is previous injury. So if you can prevent it happening in the first place, not only will you mm. save money at that point, but it can prevent the likelihood of it being an ongoing problem. So mm. we just focus on shoulders and back. Early on, we had one sensor on each arm, but again, it's an extra cost, it's an extra set of data, and it's an extra number on the reporting. So we whittled it down to one just, sensor that goes on the upper arm. Just the dominant arm. It can be, yeah, the workers generally know which arm does more work. Yeah. Um, so, but even then, like, I had a question the other day of, of a particular site where the workers are encouraged to swap arms and swap sides. So they said, oh, does that mean we swap the sensor? at that time it's like no 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 because if you you want to measure You're giving that the arm a break time yeah. yeah so if you are giving that arm a break you want to measure that so you can see what's happened throughout the day you don't want to get total of one arm and total of the other arm because that's going to give it yeah. a false reading yeah so first one again the positioning it we just found elastic strap did the trick so position that on the upper arm the other one again we looked at when you're collecting data, you want to make sure that it's from a valid and reliable position. So a lot of other wearables that have evolved in the health and safety market have created new positions. One's clipped on the belt, there's one that's clipped on the collar, and, and they have to go and validate those positions. Whereas we went off the second most validated wearable position, which is around T3, T4. So it's mm -hmm. in that upper back position between your shoulder blades. Mm -hmm. And that's where every professional athlete in pretty much every sport you can think of has a sensor. I did that for 15 years. I collected data from that. So first of all, I knew the position was validated because research had validated, validated it over 10, 15 years. But also I knew how to use that raw data. So I didn't have to start from scratch. I knew how to calculate steps out of that data, high impact movements, as well as the obvious trunk position and, and trunk injury risk. So, so it's simple, we've got the two simple sensors, one that goes around the arm and the other one that just clips over the collar and sits in that upper back position. And they're small and they're light and they're not intrusive. What no. do they weigh? I'm looking at them, oh, they're like- know. That's a good like question. 100 yeah, grams or something, they're not really- yeah, No, they're not. Yeah. They're not that. You don't and, feel them when you're on, do you? No. no, and again, they're basic. I mean, we've had workers unfortunately go home with them on because they forget that they're on, so. Yeah. Um, nice. But we've kept it basic because if you, invest heavily in fancy looking complex sensors the cost goes up mm. and it becomes mm. um cost prohibitive for Which a lot of safety me budgets to my next question yeah you're doing a nice segue for me <laughs> the other wearables what other stuff is out there because i saw something the other day on the work health and safety queensland um conference coming up the MSD, Musculoskeletal Disorders yep, Symposium, yep. and they were promoting the exoskeleton. Come yeah, and check out the exoskeleton. Yeah. What is that? And There's a couple of them around. What else is days. around? So as it's as technology is improving, there are more, and, and as universities are doing more research and trialling new things, there are more and more manual handling aids evolving, and the exoskeleton is probably at the 
more extreme end where it is basically... Do I need an exoskeleton? I'm just wondering. Maybe. Yeah. I mean, there is an example where it's being used really effectively and that is at the Alfred Hospital in Melbourne where they use it in theatres to hold limbs. So previously you've got wow, your theatre okay. hands who are holding a 30, maybe 40 kilo leg mm. for hip surgery mm. and they've got to hold that steady for Yeah, I've for seen that hours. in hospitals. Yeah. And we yeah. collected data. There's only so the, much you can do with your posture to kind of yep. uh, lean against that. And you, you can swap workers, yeah. Yeah. rotate and know, staff, yeah. but it's, it's you, still yeah. high risk, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, well, if you're mm. holding, you know, if you try to do a half squat and hold that for as long as you can, mm. the pain and the muscles start quivering and, and you can't. Muscles fatigue. But this is what these workers are doing. They're holding these heavy limbs in position. So mm. the exoskeleton in that environment... So it's strapped to their back, it's strapped to their arms, and it, it assists, it helps hold their arms up. And so, so they can gives, hold it for hours. It gives you a bit of like rigidity in your yeah. limbs, so yeah. you're a bit stiffer and solid. And yeah, yeah, and there's, I don't know the exact physics behind it, mm. um, but there is, um, like they call them power cells that actually help lift your arms up. So they, they assist the cool. muscles. Yeah. Like a robotic theatre technician. Yeah, like robot. Half robot, half yeah. man. And that is... So you talk to some people, they'll say that's the future. Mm. Um, but again, from a practicality perspective, they, you know, they, they, you've got to fit them, and they aren't one size fits all. So mm. you've got to get all, the, you've got different sizes to fit them. If they don't fit properly, then they're probably more prohibitive than assistive. Mm. You, um, might, you might have also... answered my next question as well already. Oh, Just okay. <laughs> leaving you with nothing to ask. I was going to ask you about the future and what, what's coming. What's coming for you with Preventure and what do you think is coming with wearables? Yeah, um, I think there's scope for some really exciting stuff down the track. But unfortunately, a lot of the things I've seen aren't fitting with the industry and the budgets in the industry. Mm. People have a set budget and... You know, it can be the best thing in the world. Mm. And we've seen one company in particular that I won't mention, but everyone knows. Um, they've, been co- they've been in the market. They've had wearables in the market for 10 years. And a very, very small percentage of companies can actually afford to use mm. them. Everyone else basically can't afford them. And mm. a big part of my motivation to build what we have now was to build something that was affordable for everyone. So Yeah, I think that's, that's, that budget issue is kind of across the board, isn't it, with yeah. healthcare focusing on reactive and management rather than prevention. If we could shift those budgets a bit more to prevention, yep. we could yeah. be making more of a dent in, in a lot of injuries and conditions. Yep. But to answer your question, so we've got the exoskeletons is a big, I suppose, mechanical future um, mm. tool. But we're already looking into um, one th- new concept in sport is external versus internal load ratio. So external mm-hmm. load is your movements. And that's what we measure. We measure the movements. Internal load is how your physiology responds to those movements. So that's heart rate, that's temperature, that's fatigue, that's all this sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. So the internal load versus external load ratio is something really exciting that we'll be working on over the next six to 12 months. We're going to be spending some time at Berkeley in California doing that. But also... Is that also your... Is that how quickly you recover if your internal systems are operating efficiently? Yeah. You're flush out the lactic acid and you'll go yep. again. And yeah, yeah, exactly the same as in, in, sports. in sports. You can sports get science. everyone in this room to run 5Ks. We would all get Five different Ks. heart rates. There's some Everybody pretty guys in this room, so they'll probably do pretty <laughs> quick times. But we'd all do, first of all, different performance. Mm. Second of all, different recovery. Mm. So from when we stopped, the mm. rate of, or the time at which our heart rate would get back down to our normal resting would be different. And we know that in workers, you, another example, um, again, I've gone off topic with the the whole future thing, but I'll tell this story and we'll get back to the future because (laughs) there's AR, like augmented reality headsets that are really exciting, but I'll I'll get to that in a sec. Um, So we did a project for Coca-Cola Amatol Mm -hmm. and there was two guys pretty much identical as far as build and age and muscularity and weight and all that sort of thing. And they were building, the, that was in the sales team. So they were building displays in uh, one of the supermarkets. I can't remember so which one. They take um, products in and out of the boot of their car, in and out of the shopping centre and load them up. Yeah, 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 mm. yeah. So they, it was an identical display and they had to do, they did three in a day. And so we collected data from both of them throughout the day. The data for the first build in the morning, the data sets were identical. They both so lifted the same the amount. In- 
measuring internals as well? Heart no, rate we weren't measuring heart rate, but yeah. we were measuring their movement patterns. Mm-hmm. So were they lifting? Were they carrying? Were they doing everything they should have been doing? First build of the day, perfect. Second build of the day, one of the guys towards the end, his movement patterns were a little bit more erratic. By the last one, his legs were fatigued. He was lifting with his back almost. He was There was a lot more acceleration. Because he was fatigued, he was almost throwing the cases around. Mm-hmm. So in those two guys' examples, one obviously fatigued quicker than the other. And the only way to measure that was to measure movement. their movements. And the yes. movement quality mm. dropped away with the guy who fatigued quicker. And so that's what we've now integrated into our, our product. It's mm-hmm. that having devices that can measure data Over for time. a long period mm. so that you can actually see fatigue. And if they were wearing our sensors now, that worker would have been getting alerts towards the end of the day, whereas the other worker wouldn't have. Mm. So... And I can see just thinking about that measuring someone over time, um, I can see, you know, the the other reference point for a lot of work health safety professionals would be to look at the, the Liberty Mutual sponsored snook tables, which is the uh, complicated <laughs> many pages um, of data that <coughs> directs you to a, or a, a excessive versus a safe Low, uh, not load, oh, sorry, forces, forces yeah. yeah. So yeah. newtons of force and then they get the force gauge out and you measure the push-pull force and you see if it's adequate. But that wouldn't necessarily help us over time, right? Mm. And it only goes, I think, for a day or a number, certain number of repetitions. It wouldn't be a week or... A, no, it, and even... And it's fairly complicated, yeah. can I say that? Yeah, and it's necessary. <laughs> like, yeah. And uh, all of those Lots tools. of research went into it. Yeah. Um, a lot yeah. of research quotes things out of the snook tables. Yep. And they're great. And they are definitely relevant and necessary. How does that force then relate to measuring load? Can you explain that to people who are who may be used to and familiar with force? Yeah. How to think about load? Yeah, yeah. So to go back, we our platform, the data that's displayed is in load. Because going back to what we used to do with athletes, it was all about load management. And we compile a whole heap of variables into one number, which was the load number. Mm-hmm. So I took that principle to the workplace. So we measure So one easy-to-measure number, not yes. 17 pages of snook tables. Well, <laughs> one easy-to-refer-to number. Mm-hmm. One number that you can go to a dashboard and you can see how it's tracked. Mm. And for us, the number is calculated using range and control. Um, and that's another thing. There's a lot of wearables out in the health and safety market that only measure range. So they can identify if someone's bending too far or reaching too high. But we know if we stood up now and very, very slowly bent forward and touched our toes, it's actually a good stretch for a lot of our structures, a good stretch for our back. Smooth and controlled, safe. Yeah, Mm. nice and smooth and controlled, and it's Mm -hmm. a good stretch. If you do it as fast as you can, then there's a high injury risk. So really, the range is the same, Mm. but the movement control is completely different. So that's what I took from the sports world, where we measured a lot of control elements, and we incorporate that into our algorithms. So we measure load, which incorporates range, control, and time. So the difference between getting back to your question, sorry, I ramble a bit, but getting AR, back to your question. something about AR. Um, the comparison between load oh. and force. Mm-hmm. So you could get five, again, another example, five people who are required to generate the same amount of force to do a task, whether it's pushing or pulling. All five of them will generate the same amount of force to do the task, but they'll do it in different ways. So again, going back to the the flight attendants, there's force needed to lift the seven kilo bag from the ground up to the height of the overhead compartment. So Mm -hmm. the force would be seven kilos times 9.85 times gravity. So that's the Newtons is the same for both workers, but they did it in a different way. So early on, I realized when I was measuring force and I was using all of the force Force dynamometers and I was getting all of these readings and I was graphing it and charting it and and inertia and I was getting all these inertia values and it was great. I was excited about it. No one cared. (laughs) They they said, well, we know what the weight of the object is. The Mm. Coca-Cola guys, that example, each case of drinks weighed the same amount. So they knew what the force was to move them. What they didn't know was how the workers moved them individually. And when that worker fatigued, he was still generating the same amount of force, Mm. but he was doing it in a way that was a high risk because he had fatigued and his control had gone. So that's why we focus on on load monitoring 
rather than Pure the force, force required to do yeah. tasks. Yeah. yeah. Okay, going back to my uh, other question about the future, now's your chance to look into my crystal ball. Uh, you've got an actual crystal ball. Real deal. <laughs> nice. And uh, you were going to say something very cool about augmented reality, I'm yes. sure. Yes, well, looking into the crystal ball, I, I can probably see what I want, <laughs> but what's likely to happen. Definitely yeah. one thing that is already happening, which is part of the reason why I'm still here doing this, is the cost of technology drops. Coming down. Yeah. So as the cost of technology, wearable technology, augmented reality, um, smart patches, so there's little adhesive patches that can measure temperature and movement and heart rate and all this. So there's a lot of really cool technology evolving. So a big part of the company that I've set up is to pave the way for that technology to get into the workplace, not be, just be to be stuck by in people. And, yeah, yeah, or to make mm, it usable in the mm. workplace, not just to get stuck in the medical profession or stuck in the sports wearables profession. So, mm. and probably yeah. also that attitude that some people I've heard in the workplace, oh, I don't want the boss checking on me. You yeah. know that attitude that this is this is science and it's to help you. Yeah, you know, trying to make it more commonplace that. Yeah, and, and it's early, for a good cause. Early on, again, when I spent when I was at Aon and spending time with these workers, I'd find that they, I'd, I'd want heart rate. I'd want to measure <laughs> heart rate throughout the day. No, 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 you're not putting heart, you're not measuring because then my boss will see how hard I'm working, and mm. that's not all right. And GPS tracking as well. That they, mm. they don't want to be tracked around the site. So those were the two things early on I picked up. But you know, going back to augmented reality headsets, there's now a pair. I can't remember the name of the brand, but you can get cycling glasses now that pair with your phone and it's the same, it's fighter pilot helmet technology where there's a display cool. in the lens. And so you'd be riding along and a little image would come up showing your speed, showing the angle of the next corner, showing the incline of the next mountain. It would pair with your GPS device on your phone. So your little Google map would pop up and it's and your heart rate. So it will show if you've set in certain thresholds, so you know if you're racing, you've got to get up this mountain, but you don't want to get above a certain heart rate and all these thresholds. It shows it on the your visual inside this helmet, so uh, inside wow. these these um, glasses. So if my goal is to trial them in a workplace in the next twelve mm. months, so that we've already because most of our and we built our technology to be based on a smartphone. Mm -hmm. So same thing, if a worker is wearing a clear pair of these sunnies, safety glasses, and the smartphone it is sending the matrix. data. Yeah, I'm giving away all my little. secrets here. What's going mm. on? <laughs> but that's true. Don't this worry, is, I'm not going to make them. I've this is the no future. Idea. Yeah. But imagine having, you know, nurses in the hospital environment wearing a pair of safety glasses or in theatre and it was providing them feedback with their injury risk as they're doing the rounds of rolling patients in the ICU mm. or, yeah. So it's, that's looking into the crystal ball. That's what I, um, I see into the future. Cool. Uh, your other work in the US. You've been over there a lot. I noticed you changed your LinkedIn profile recently to living in San Francisco. <laughs> yeah. um, what's going on over there? And can you tell us a bit about that? And, and is America's approach to injury prevention very different to ours? Yeah. I, so the first few months I was over there, I was part of a, a, a startup accelerator, basically. So um, I was entering a world that I didn't particularly enjoy because all of a sudden I wasn't talking to people preventing injuries in a work site. I was talking to very rich Silicon Valley investors, convincing them to back us to take this global and to Whole another to language help. there. Yeah, yeah. And so it was a very hard three months being away from the family, but more so sort of being away from the reason why we're doing this in the first place, which mm. is solving injury prevention problems for... for um, On the coalface with yeah, the workers. Yeah, the workers. Mm. So anyway, we, we did raise funds and we got a, a, um, accepted into this Berkeley, this program at Berkeley, which is going to help us evolve the program further, but also increase traction in the US. So from the sh I did do, we did do a trial for Denver City um, firefighters. So over there, the firefighters are part of the Denver City Council or the Denver City and County, I think they call it. Um, mm -hmm. And so for me, 
getting that trial across the line was a lot easier than getting trials across the line in Australia. And I actually, the story, it's an interesting story because I went in. Why is that? What do they, how do they think differently? And this is a case of one. So this is, an, I don't know whether this is a good example of what I can expect when I go back over there. Um, but I walked into this office and it was something like, it was out of a movie with this 60, overweight, 62, 63 year old guy who had been in the risk management role for the council for 30, 40 years and he didn't even get up to sort of say hello or greet me. He said, yeah, come in, sit down. And so I start my spiel saying, this is what we do, this is why. And he said, I'm going to stop you there. I saw this at a conference not long ago. I love it. Let's do it. All right. He, and that so it. an hour meeting went for 15 minutes. He wrote the name and the number of the person I had to call and gave that to me. So I called that person and within weeks we had a trial lined up and yeah, so it was different. And I think it's different because of uh, it's a big place. There are so many people in the scale. Are they more tech savvy? Are they more embracing technology maybe than we are? I don't know. Maybe they're more open to change. Mm. Yeah. I don't know whether it's tech in particular, but uh, they're more open to cha- changing things to find a better solution. And, um, yeah, and that's and I've also spoken to a company called Briotics, which are the world's biggest safety service provider. And saying that they had already tested all of the other options. Mm -hmm. And so I met with them. And again, it was a bit of like, well, we've kind of seen it. How are you different? And then within a couple of weeks, they said, this is the best thing we've ever seen. Let's meet. We want to integrate this into everything we've got. And so, yeah, things happen at a faster pace there. Maybe because they have to, because there's so many people and the consequences of not Mm. solving a problem quickly Mm, are high. scale of things. Yeah, yeah. Mm. But I mean, I'd say the consequences of not solving a problem they get left the, behind in the market. Yeah, and... the financial consequences are huge, mm. but also, you know, the psychosocial consequences. They understand every single worker that they've got out there, like Denver City firefighters. If they've got firefighters that are all injured, then, you know, that's not only going to be all over the media and um, mm. and it's not a good look, but people, safety. the safety yeah, of people is, safety. is, yeah. Is, mm. And that's, the, I suppose, the number one priority. So um, you're going back to America after this. We caught you on a brief visit to Australia, did we? Uh, no, I'm back for um, a month or so, just okay. trying to yeah, sort things out. And okay. yeah, I mean, we, I want to make sure, obviously, we've got a lot of traction in Australia um, and it's evolving. Mm. So we're, we're not a company that just provides a product and then steps back and moves on to the next client. We're constantly sourcing feedback from our current users to build new features. So... One of the reasons why I'm back is now to do workshops with a lot of um, our users to find out what's next. What else can we use this data for? What's working? What's not working? How can we change it? Mm-hmm. And one of the big features actually we're, we're looking at integrating is delivering safety training through the app as well. So all of these companies have the same, like my mum's nursing home, they had yeah. all that safety training content yeah. sitting in the manual in the head office. If that was in an app and if that got drip fed to my mum every two weeks, every month in modules, mm. and my mum would read through, flick through, answer some questions. From a compliance perspective, the employer was doing the right thing, but from a worker perspective, the Easy to access. Yeah, the information mm. would have made a difference, hopefully. So that's that's another thing. And little things like that that we're or we're constantly mm. evolving what we're doing mm. to um to deliver a better outcome. So you're a busy man, you've got a lot going on. <laughs> How do you keep yourself up to date? I'm just thinking some of our listeners, health, uh, health and safety professionals or occupational health um, professionals, what's your go-to? What's your quick fix for some professional development? Do you have any conferences that are on your hit list this year? Yeah, I'm probably not a good person to talk to. I'm a bit of a nerd. <laughs> I love. I, I still love a good journal. I'll get a, a bunch of journal articles. I'll photocopy them. And I'll read. I'll read them on the plane. But there's apparently there's a really good new manual handling podcast that's come out, which oh, I'll, I'll the definitely manual handling tune collective. into. I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a podcast nut as well. I love all, yeah, all things podcasts, mm. particularly uh, more, more sports related. Mm-hmm. And, and um, you know, British General Sports Medicine podcast is a good one. And, mm. and um, yeah, so the, podcasts um, and conferences, of course. I love a good conference. Mm. Are you going to the Australian Association of Manual Handling of People, AMHP, yes. conference? Uh, well, I've been asked to get in some um, abstracts and oh, do good. another workshop like so I did last year. people see you there? Yes. Year before. I think that's two yearly. That's one of my favourite ones. Yeah, that's a good one. 
I just want to say thank you so much for your time no flying worries. in briefly to Australia for us. Ah, uh, yeah, no, no worries. <laughs> thanks for thanks for asking me. It's a yeah, honor. and um, if people want to hear any more information about Preventure and your products, we give us some links to put in the show notes. They can find out where to yeah contact you and your team. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's the website Preventure Live, but otherwise, yeah, it's all there. Very if you good. search it, you'll find it. <laughs> thanks for your time, Scott Coleman. No worries. Thanks. I hope you found Scott Coleman and our chat about wearable tech interesting. What I loved was his future predictions about uh, how wearable tech is becoming more mainstream and more affordable for more workplace athletes. You have been listening to the Manual Handling Collective podcast. If you're only listening through audio, we've also filmed this episode if you want to see a little extra like Scott's demonstration, see the link in the show notes subscribe to stay notified of future episodes like share comment and get in touch to hear more of what you want if you know a guest who'd be a great fit for the show just let me know okay so you've got the sensors there can you um can you pop it on me and show me how it works yeah of course so we've got the two sensors one that goes on the arm so pop that just around with that elastic strap and the other one just clips over the collar. I can pop that in place if you want. So that just sits there on the upper back. So both sensors are connected to the app by Bluetooth. Mm -hmm. And I'll just turn my phone off silent because there we go. So now what will happen, if you want to move that chair, uh, maybe move it in a nice safe way first. So move that chair in a way, maybe just from there to there. You see, there was no alerts. So if you move back over in a unsafe way or in a rushed way or and there's the alert. So you can imagine if you're in an environment where you're doing there's a lot going on and you're getting a lot of yeah. work done, it'll prompt you to stop doing what you're doing and think about what you're doing. That's